Well, I am very thankful uh, to be here this morning. Uh, very gracious of, of Tommy to allow somebody to take some of his preaching time, and I'm, I'm, I'm honored and, and humbled by it, as, as you can imagine. Um, I'm already getting the jokes about Shannon must be preaching because he has a tie on and a coat of few colors. So uh, that's true. I don't uh, do this very often. And probably the last time I wore uh, a coat and tie here was, I, I might have been preaching. It very well could have been the case. And some of you may not realize this, but when we were meeting at the old location off Vista, I did do a little bit of preaching, not a whole lot. Tommy would uh, allow me to do that. And I became an elder. And at that time, and, and still, I've, I've been in the middle of a sermon series on Colossians. So starting back, I don't know, 2009, 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there, I, I've been on a series in Colossians, and I tried this on Barry, so let's see if this works. I'm going to put it on hold, though, my series on Colossians. He's the only one going to laugh, but uh, the reality is someday I may finish that up, and, uh, but it's not going to be today or for the next three weeks. I'm going to use the next few weeks to, to, to work through three Psalms, and um, I have been on a mission for the past several years to learn more about the Old Testament. Uh, not to the exclusion of the New Testament. I love the New Testament. I've spent most of my time in the New Testament. But I have come to the realization, or I did come to the realization, that you don't have a good understanding of the New Testament without old, knowing your Old Testament. And so I've decided to venture out and preach from the Old Testament these next few weeks. So uh, you can be praying for, for me, and, and Andy's going to be doing the same thing with his series sermon, uh, series that he does. He's going to be preaching from Zephaniah. So you're going to get a good dose of the Old Testament for these next six weeks, and I'm excited about that. Well, let's bow our heads in prayer, and then we'll dive in. Dear Holy Father, We come to you this morning, humbly. We come to you to worship. We come to give you glory, to sing your praises. Your name is above all names. And we are humbled by that. And Lord, I pray that we would recognize that, that we would understand our position before you. Too often we are blind, we are arrogant, we are haughty, and we have no shame at times. Yet if we understood you, who you are, your character, and how far away from that uh, we would curl up with much shame. But Lord, you have also shown us much grace. You've shown us much mercy. And so we come to you this morning with, with prayers for the service, the sermon. We come to you with prayers for the ministries of our church. Lord, I pray for the Bible Institute, this ministry of the word that's vital to, uh, to our raising up of future pastors, teachers, discipleship and people who just want to know more about you through the study of doctrine and church history, all those things that are helpful for, to help us grow in our maturity and our understanding. I want to pray for the prison ministry as well. I'm so thankful that we have men and, and, uh, and Linda as well who are, uh, just have a passion for going to these people, these prisoners, to teach the Word of God, to preach it, to provide counsel uh, through creative ways, writing letters to them, and providing much encouragement, and especially the gospel of Jesus Christ. I also want to pray for our sister churches in the, in the greater Houston area, ones that we continually pray for. We are thankful that they are preaching today proclaiming your word faithfully as they go through the scriptures word by word, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, 
explaining the truth so that those who don't know you may come to you and those who do know you may grow. Lord, I want to pray specifically for Travis Cardwell at University Park Baptist Church and Kyle Newcomer. I pray for his ministry, especially as they've transitioned. And I pray for Will Wright at First Baptist Church of South Houston, my old home church. Lord, I am so excited to see a faithful gospel minister there. And I pray that you would encourage him as that labor is a tough and challenging one. May he not grow weary. And may he continue to be focused on you as you prepare a harvest in whatever way you see fit. I also want to pray for the missionaries that we support. I want to pray for Joe Owen as he continues to minister in Latin America. Lord, it's exciting to see all the things that he's doing. I'm excited for how we are partnering up with him in any way possible. Thankful for Barry and for for Corey as they're getting ready to go to Ecuador with him. Lord, we pray for more opportunities. We're thankful for how bold he is and how clear he is uh, with the word as he engages the, the culture there with your word. It's such a great example for us, and may we have the same courage that he does, and may we be strengthened as he's strengthened with our prayers. And I want to pray for the believers at Santiago Baptist Church in the Philippines. Lord, small group of faithful believers, but Lord, encourage them. I know the things are rough. It's hard. Just even me. I pray for the elders there. I pray that they would not give up the fight and that you would keep them together as they continue to uh, just work through tough times. I also want to pray for the, the Arabic publishing ministry that we're supporting. And I pray that uh, we would continue to support this financially. Our hearts would be open to this as, as tools are being uh, given to pastors in the Arabic language, good tools, good books to help with the pastoral ministry. And we pray that the gospel would just strategically penetrate these hard areas. And we know your word is powerful. We know that it can thrive there. And so I I pray that this ministry would continue uh, to be strong, even though it may be small, that it may blossom and reap a great harvest. And Father, I pray for our church. Be with us today, your people here at Providence. May your name be exalted as we study your word. Help us to be faithful as the trials come. Help us to know how to love you more as we continue to worship you today. And may you be glorified as we proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who sits at your right hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to begin today with a background. So bear with me because I'm going to go through the the life of David. Not every, every detail. But I think it's important as we read through many of these Psalms uh, to know about the life of David. And I'm also going to touch a little bit more detail with the life of David uh, and specifically with the story of, of David and Absalom. So David was a shepherd who eventually became king of Israel. When David was a shepherd, Saul was actually the king of Israel. And Saul was the inaugural king of Israel. The people of Israel thought Saul had the appearance of a good king. But they would soon see his shortcomings and failures. God, through his providence, uses the weaknesses of Saul to allow David to enter the courts of King Saul. Saul had David play the lyre for him when he was depressed. Also, David kills Goliath after no one in the army of Israel, including King Saul, was brave enough to fight faithfully for the Lord. And as you read about Saul, you realize that he had a serious problem. He did not obey God. 
He was arrogant. He was presumptuous. And as a result, the prophet Samuel says to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And from that passage in 1 Samuel, we see what the Lord wants. He wants a man after his own heart. Who is this person who is after God's heart? Who is that? And many of you know it's David. It's David who has given that description. So as a result, King Saul becomes jealous of David. Why is he jealous? And some of you say, well, it's obvious. Saul knows God has promised to remove the kingdom from him and his children. He also knows that God has favored David and the people of Israel love David more than Saul. King Saul's jealousy turns to rage and hatred for David. King Saul tries to kill David several times, but God would not let King Saul harm him. Despite King Saul's determination to kill David, David remains faithful to God's anointed. David would not dare lay a hand on God's anointed, even if the king, the king of Israel, would try to kill him. Eventually, King Saul is killed in battle, along with Jonathan, his son, David's very close friend. And David is anointed king of Israel. When David becomes king, he is determined to follow God faithfully. One of the ways he does this is by fighting God's enemies. He engages in many battles that eventually lead to peace and the nation of Israel becomes secure under his rule and authority. God has given David dominion Complete rule and authority over Israel. Now, two significant events happen during this part of David's life. First, David tries to bring the ark to Jerusalem. And, and as, as many of you have heard from me from our Old Testament class, I, I like to talk about the ark because it's a visible picture of God dwelling with his picture. And so David's trying to bring the ark because it, it's a symbol. It shows that God is with him and he's with the nation. And second, God establishes a covenant with David. Now, real quick, let's turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And I will be going to a lot of scriptures today. Some of them you'll be able to just listen. Some will actually turn to. In our Old Testament Sunday school class that we did recently, I came up with a list of verses that are really important to know, and this is one of them. You should always know these if, as best you can as you're reading through the Old Testament and even into the New Testament. 2 Samuel chapter 7, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 16. Now, when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan, the prophet, see, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? 
I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Crucial passage as we are going through these Psalms. Because it establishes his kingship. Despite David's zeal for God, which you see quite often in his story, he still sins. Despite that covenant that's given, he still sins. His most famous or infamous sins are adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. The consequences of his sin are interesting. First, David repents of his sin, which is good. He marries Bathsheba, and they have children. Odd, you married the woman of the person you murdered. God takes away their first son. However, they have another son, Solomon, who will eventually follow David to be the king of Israel. And we see mercy there. We see grace. Now, let's, let's think about the story of David and Absalom. It's tragic. The story of Absalom begins with his brother, Amnon. Amnon lusts after his sister, Tamar, who is, who is Absalom's full sister. Amnon asks King David to let Tamar help him while he is sick. There's only one problem. Amnon's not really sick. He merely wants an opportunity to fulfill his lustful desires with Tamar. And he did this in the vilest way by raping her. And after raping her, he then hates her and sends her away. Absalom hears about Amnon raping his sister and is angry, and understandably so. And from this moment, he stews over the evil committed by Amnon and plots his revenge. Absalom waits two years and then has his servants kill his brother. King David is angry. Absalom flees from the wrath of the king. And after some time, King David allows him to come back, to return safely to Jerusalem. But he is not allowed to be in the king's presence. 
But Aslam's not satisfied with this. He's not happy with this arrangement. He is shunned and grows more discontent. He eventually sows seeds of distrust between the people of Israel and King David. Eventually, Absalom conspires to kill King David so that he can rule the nation of Israel. David flees Jerusalem. He is distressed and heartbroken. Now, I tell you all of these stories because you can see all the ups and downs in David's life. You can see how he would be stressed and under duress. And you can see how he would be joyful and sing God's praises. You can see where God humbles him and where God exalts him. And those types of emotions and struggles and themes run throughout the Psalms, especially the ones that he writes. And so think about these types of things. Imagine some of these things as we're going through these Psalms and specifically as we go through Psalm 8. So turn to Psalm 8 now, and I want to read it to you. All right, Psalm 8. To the choir master, according to the Giddeth, a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? Yet, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let me start with the superscription. It's easy to skip over that. And I don't want to go too deep on it. But it tells us that this psalm is a psalm of David. And by superscription, I mean that part that says, To the choir master, according to the Giddeth, a psalm of David. That's part of the inspired scripture. Okay? And so I take this part that says a psalm of David to mean that David wrote the psalm. Okay? And he wrote many of the Psalms that are in book one. And if you remember, uh, the Psalms are broken up, broken up into five major books. And, this, and in this one, the book one, where Psalm 8 comes from, uh, many of them, if not most of them, are written by David. And these Psalms fit well with his life themes and challenges and experiences. And, and, and here's more evidence of, of what I mean by this. Turn quickly to Acts chapter 4. Okay, quickly to Acts chapter 4. These types of things are important for your doctrine of Scripture. They seem so insignificant, yet they're important. Acts chapter 4. Verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. 
who through the mouth of our father, what does it say there? David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. There we have inspiration. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now, that passage is not the passage I'm preaching today. That's Psalm chapter 2 or Psalm 2. And notice if, there, if, you, if you were to just quickly look back at Psalm 2, there's no superscription there. You don't have it of David. But Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, says that David wrote it and that he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to do that. So given this, this is one of the main reasons why I believe David wrote Psalm 8. Now, let's, let's go ahead and start digging into the verses here. Psalm 1, or Psalm 8, verse 1, the majestic name of the Lord, Yahweh. This psalm fits well into the overarching themes of the book of Psalms. And Psalms 1 and 2, which we just quoted from uh, part of, it, uh, part of uh, Psalm 2, provide those overarching themes. Psalm 1 tells us of the blessed man who was one who obeys the Torah, the commands of God. And Psalm 2 tells us of those who obey and follow God's anointed. And when we think of anointed, think Messiah, think King. And those who obey and follow God's anointed, they will be blessed. And so it's important to understand these two uh, books, or sorry, these two psalms, how they kind of undergird much of the psalms. You will see it go in and out, in and out, the tapestry that happens there. Because we see a lot about the word of God and the commands and obeying them. It's part of the covenant of David. And also we see this this idea of following uh, God's king, the one he appoints, and how important it is to be faithful. And so in verse 1 of Psalm 8, we read, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. And so David begins this psalm by setting the tone. And this psalm is a beautiful psalm, explaining in part the connection or the bond between God and man. And there's even some twist with that. And so what is this tone? David praises God. He exalts God by proclaiming the greatness of the name of the Lord. And and, and why the focus on the name of God? How important do you think your name is? Do you ever think about that? Do you ever recognize how important that is? Hopefully you do. I'm going to test you on this. I'm going to write you a check today. Not really. I'm going to, this is an illustration. But what if I did write you a check today for $500? And if you didn't have a name... How easily is it, easy is it going to be to cash it? Or, or what if I just don't put your name in it? What if I don't do that? How are you going to do that if I don't put to the pay to the order of your name? That $500 check is worthless. And so you can see how important just as we try to function in life with some of the basic things, your name is important. It's important because it identifies who you are. So if we didn't have names, we would just be walking around and say, hey, you. Now, some of you may do that already just because you're bad at knowing names, and I would fall into that category. But in some ways, that's disrespectful, right? We don't want to be walking around saying, hey, you. Now, names are important because they help us with communication. They help us with relationships and identity that uniquely separates us from others. So in the Hebrew language, the term for name most probably meant sign or distinctive mark. 
And so in Psalm 8, 1, uh, the word Lord, which is a name, the word Lord appears twice. However, they are two separate words. Each name is a sign and distinctive mark for the person God. Yahweh is the first Lord that you see there. And it is the proper name of God. And Adonai is the second Lord. And it carries the idea of master and owner. Both names help us know who God is and how distinct he is from us. Both names are tied to the very nature of God. So when we say Yahweh's name is majestic, we are saying God is majestic. When we say Adonai's name is full of splendor, we are saying God is full of splendor. The majesty and splendor of Yahweh's name spreads over his entire creation. Again, it's not the mere name. It is the very essence of God that is majestic. And his name and essence are known throughout the entire earth. So let's look at verse 2. And here the Lord uses the weak to humble the strong or he humbles the strong. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. As David praises the name of Yahweh, he provides us with a picture of his power and wisdom in verse 2. The first part of this picture is God's strength. God establishing or founding his strength is not surprising. If we have a biblical worldview, we naturally see God as having great power and strength. We may think of God humbling Pharaoh with his mighty works delivering the Israelites. We may think of God leading Joshua and the Israelites into battle, defeating the Canaanites as they go into the promised land. When we think of these displays of God's mighty acts, we often think, or at least I do, of the hymn, A mighty fortress is our God, a bulk work never failing. It shows his strength and his power and his might. And the second part of this picture that we get in verse 2 is, is God's wisdom. God's wisdom, David says, out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength. That's perplexing. I don't know about you, but this is not what I normally think of. Or I don't normally equate babies and infants with strength. We typically think of babies as frail and weak. Now, we may say this baby is strong uh, when with their tiny fingers they, they wrap, wrap around your finger and they squeeze. And you go, wow, that's strong. Uh, I rewatched a video recently. Uh, my dad passed away. But I have a video of Nathan as a little tiny baby. And I see my dad's big hands. And he's, my dad's dying at this point in time. And so it's the only grandson he got to see. But he's, he's playing with Nathan's feet and his, and his hands. And, and the baby is strong. And we talk about that in the video Wow, he's strong. He's going to be strong someday. And we find this cute and adorable. But the reality is, uh, Nathan was not the Incredible Hulk. Then, uh, and unfortunately like his daddy now, not now either. So, um, But babies are typically frail and weak. Now we may say, uh, say these things and kind of laugh about it, but however... This is the wisdom of God. And this is what David is telling us about God. Yahweh uses the weak things of this world to humble his enemies. 
He humbles them. I believe David sees himself to be like one of these babies. David does not consider himself mighty and strong. He gives glory to Yahweh for all his successes in battle. He gives glory to Yahweh for his successes in leading the people of Israel. David sees himself as a humble servant of a mighty, all-powerful God. The enemies of God are strong in their own eyes. There's no doubt about that. But in the eyes of God, they can't even stand up to a baby. David knows that the enemies of God cannot stand against God's anointed. In fact, David says that God will still or silence his enemy, his avenger. Let's take a moment and turn to Matthew chapter 21. Go to verse 12 of Matthew 21. Matthew 21, verse 12. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. In this passage, Jesus is clearly indignant with the chief priests and the scribes. And we need to remember the purpose of the temple. Again, this is in the temple. This is the place where God would dwell with his people. God dwelt with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. This is a form of the temple. God dwelt with the Israelites in the tabernacle as they wandered through the wilderness. This is a form of the temple. God dwelt with the nation of, of Israel when Solomon built the temple, Solomon's temple, in Jerusalem. And now what is interesting to see is Jesus' reaction to how the chief priests and scribes have allowed the temple to be desecrated and defiled. Jesus, the Son of God, who is called God with us, cleanses the temple. And as the chief priests and scribes get angry with him, Jesus fires back with Scripture out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes. You have prepared praise. And this is from our passage. This is a quote of Psalm 8.2. And so when Jesus quotes this passage, he's affirming two things. First, he is affirming his deity. He is affirming he is the Messiah. The Son of God is applying this passage to the religious leaders who should be protecting the integrity of the temple. They are the ones who are being humbled by the children who are praising Jesus. Jesus is applying this passage to himself. And that's the other thing that's very important to understand. The children are praising the Son of God, which humiliates or who humiliates God's enemies. Let's go back to Psalm chapter 8. 
or Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4. What is man and the son of man? When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him? These next two verses or these two verses we just looked at, Uh, look at man versus the rest of God's creation. So David looks into the night sky, and what does he see? He sees the moon and stars. He probably sees more than we see today because he didn't have all the city light pollution that we have. In this passage, David is using Genesis 1 to make his point. And so let me read something to you. Let's remember Genesis 1, verses 14 through 19. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be signs and for seasons and for days and years. Let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, And the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. So let's ponder for a moment like David, about the moon and the stars. So I went on to the answers in Genesis website, and they write this, that God's glorious handiwork can be seen in what he made. He made the moon to orbit the earth about 240,000 miles away. He made the sun to be over 100 times larger than the diameter of the earth. He made the stars, the closest being Alpha Centauri, which is 25 trillion miles away from our planet. And he made our galaxy that contains over, contains over 100 billion stars, nebula and star clusters, And that's not even considering the other hundreds of billions of galaxies of stars. The immensity of the universe is unimaginable. And God made it all. As we consider the quantity and the distances of these stars, my mind has a difficult time even understanding this vastness. It blows me away. And so as we work through the rest of Psalm 8, we will see David's use of Genesis 1. And and this is kind of, we're getting a look at how he's seeing things and the vastness of God's creation. Here's another just important note to make. The fact that David uses Genesis 1 should press upon us the importance of this chapter. The very first chapter in the Bible. God's creation of the universe, including our planet, is not an optional belief. The work of God's finger is a vital part of Christian doctrine. And every believer should know and embrace this truth. Otherwise, passages like this will be somewhat foolish to us. And then we would be foolish ourselves. But that's not the case. So let's dig a little deeper then. Why is the doctrine of creation important to David? In verse 4, God's creative work leads David to a fundamental question. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? So let's take a moment and look at that word man. The The word man is used twice, but... It is interestingly two different Hebrew words for man. 
Unfortunately, we don't quite have the way to translate that so that you can see this. So the first man in verse 4, that Hebrew word is Enosh. It's the same word used for, for uh, the name of Seth's son. And if you, you can see this in Genesis chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, it says, Where Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. The word Enosh can also refer to mankind or human beings, and it can even refer to a single man. Uh, the second man in verse 4 is Adam. It's kind of a Hebrew way of, I think if I remember Hebrew correctly, kind of how you say that. But you know that word better is Adam. That second word is Adam. And as you guessed it, that's the same word from Genesis 2 and 3. And that word can also refer to mankind and human beings. So this leads to a question. Is this passage talking about mankind? Or is David playing off of these two words from Genesis to make a point? Many commentators believe it is talking about mankind. David is using the different words for man in a poetic way to draw attention to the wonder of God's affection for mankind. This usage would be another reference to Genesis 1, and in particular, verses 26 and 27 of chapter 1, where God said, Then God said, Let, let us make man, Adam, in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man, Adam, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In other words, David is used... David is saying it's amazing that God cares for creatures such as us. Look at the moon. Look at the stars. How could the creator, uh, creator of those heavenly bodies even care about us frail, puny uh, human beings? How is that possible? And the implied answer is God does and wants you to know this. And why do we need to know this? For me, the answer is simple. It's what Tommy taught on at the beginning today. It's worship. It's worship. We are to worship him. Yahweh created us to worship him. All creation was put in place by the hand of God to reflect his glory. Now, there is another way, as I said, of interpreting David's use of of the different words for man. It is David's self-awareness of where he stands in history. By using the words Enosh and Adam, David notes his place in God's redemptive history. David sees himself as God's anointed or Messiah. God has chosen him to lead his people. And this is part of the theme of Psalm 2 that runs through the book of Psalms, including this verse in Psalm 8. It's in the background. In other words, David is reflecting on why God cares for him. David sees himself as a mere man. He sees himself as insignificant in comparison to the majestic creation of the moon and stars. Yet God has chosen him. One commentator writes, David understands his own place in the line of descent that starts from Adam and that in the promises, promise of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God answered Satan's triumphant roar with a baby's cry. Let's move on to verses 5 through 8 of Psalm 8. Man's dominion over God's creation. Yet you have made him a little lower than heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. 
You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. As we look at these verses, David continues to see or continues to use Genesis 1 as his backdrop for how he sees himself in God's plan. And returning to Genesis 1, verse 26, we see that God assigns man a role. Man is to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the, of, of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps. The word for dominion in Genesis 1, 26 is different than what David uses in Psalm 8, 6. However, both words are used the same way. They both express the idea of ruling over something. As you are thinking about our passage, verses 5 through 8, remember that we are talking about David, the king of Israel. We see the words crowned and dominion. These words are appropriately applied to a king. These words are another way David connects himself to Adam's direct lineage. It, it seems David feels the weight of the responsibility of the king who rules over God's people. Now, we need to give more attention to verse 5. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. What are the heavenly beings in this verse? And this one's a little more tricky. Let me read what some of the other versions have. So in the ESV, I just said, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. If you have the New American Standard, yet you have made him a little lower than God. And if you have the NIV, you have made them a little lower than the angels. Three versions, three interpretations. I don't know if I'm going to completely solve that problem. <laughs> but it is good for us to understand this and know it. God, angels, or heavenly beings, which one's correct? The Hebrew word in this verse is Elohim. And many of you probably know that word. And if I were to go up to you and say, if for those of you who know it, what is Elohim? You're going to instantly tell me what? God. All right? And, and in this particular case, it's plural, so literally meaning gods. In fact, Elohim is, is the word used to refer to God in Genesis. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. So one interesting thing to note this is the only time in the ESV that Elohim is interpreted as heavenly beings. <laughs> so it's, you're going, well, why do they do that? I don't get it. That's, by the way, that's one time out of 2,597 times. So the main reason, there is a logic. The main reason the ESV and NIV use heavenly beings and angels is because of the Septuagint. At least I think that's influencing it. And as a reminder, the Septuagint is the Greek version of the Old Testament back early on. Uh, you know, Jesus and them would have been using this. And in that version, the word is angel, angelos in the Greek. So I think that's what's influencing that interpretation. So regardless of the word, by the way, this is my way of telling you I'm not going to answer the question. But regardless of the word, the main point to not forget is the lowly position of man. And that is what you need to remember. Despite the lowly position, God still gives man and David a kingly role over his creation, including God's creation of the nation of Israel. Let's move to Psalm 8, verse 9. It's going to sound familiar. The majestic name of the Lord, Yahweh. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
In the final verse of Psalm 8, David ends just as he began. And so let me refresh you of what I said earlier. The word Lord appears twice. We have one that's Yahweh, one that's Adonai. Yahweh is the proper name. Adonai has the idea of master, owner. Both names help us to know God and how distinct he is from us. And this makes sense now after everything we've gone through. Both names are tied to his very nature. And so when we say Yahweh's name is majestic, we are saying God is majestic. And when we say Adonai's name is full of splendor, we are saying God is full of splendor. So David has brought us full circle. David is praising God for giving him a lowly man, a kingly position, just as God gave man a lowly creature, a kingly, kingly position over God's creation. So, what does this mean for us? 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28, we read earlier. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those whom have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, uh, deliver the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. I actually skipped intentionally that verse back in Psalm 8. He put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then the rest of that passage, it talks about subjection. Putting things under, in subjection under his feet. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking... It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you were mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. We recognize all those. And then he quotes Psalm 8 again, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned. Notice that word, crowned. Wow, where did I hear that? Psalm 8. Crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Now, everyone... Get your bulletin for a second. Object lesson. On the front. I don't know about you, but I have been wowed by the James Webb telescope images. Are y'all, if, if you haven't followed this at all, go look it up online. Some of the pictures that are coming out from this telescope. This is one of the pictures. Of course, this is not doing justice to it. But, but, but study it for a moment. Look at it. All those pieces of light, those are galaxies. And in galaxies, what's in them? Stars, right? I mean, there's a lot here. And this is just a small fraction, I mean, very tiny fraction of what's in the sky. And look how much is in that picture. It blows my mind away. That telescope cost $10 billion, took two, over two decades to develop, and by gathering infrared light, which is why this one's even better than the previous one, I can't remember what it is, the Hubble, that's right, the Hubble, uh, but this one gathers infrared light, which is invisible to the human eye. The telescope is able to cut through the cosmic dust and see far into the past, and so one of the new telescope's main goals is to find galaxies so distant 
that their light travels almost the entire history of the universe to reach the telescope. And I hope this, this telescope will help us understand, at least in some ways, how Scripture works, especially as we're looking at Psalm 8, 1 Corinthians 15, and Hebrews 2. So in theory, the purpose of the telescope is to help scientists discover very old galaxies. That's their theory they're working off of. And, and, and of course, I'm amazed they spent so much money on this purpose, because obviously we have the Bible right in front of us that helps us out with this. But there are some similarities here with Scripture. Scripture helps us look to the future to understand God's purposes. When David wrote Psalm 8, he had a limited understanding of the future impact of his writings. You know, he, he's just struggling with life in many ways and expressing that. And, and, and not just trials, but just praising God and just it comes out. But God knew exactly what was going on. And he does this throughout all of Scripture. Genesis 3.15 was pointing us to the future. Psalm 8 was pointing us to the future. These passages, along with the entire corpus of Scripture, is God's plan of redemption. God used David to write about crowning King David and putting everything under the subjection of King David. Paul and the author of Hebrews, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, see Psalm 8 as a messianic passage. In short, this passage points to Jesus Christ. It points to King Jesus, who was incarnate a little lower than the angels, was crowned with glory and honor as God put his entire creation under King Jesus' feet. Why does God do this? Well, to fulfill Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. To fulfill 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 13, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. To fulfill Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what's going on. So where are you today? Are you doubting the scriptures? Do you struggle with that? Do you really believe what's going on in Psalm 8 here and how it points to Jesus Christ? Are you skeptical when we explain what God has revealed in the pages of our Bibles? Are you one of those who say, that sounds interesting, but I just can't, I just can't go there. Are you one of those who say, I want to believe that Jesus is who the Bible says he is, but something just won't let me believe? Well, here's my appeal to you. Cry out to God and say, help my unbelief. Help me. I, I encourage you, ask for forgiveness and ask God to help you. Because that's where salvation comes. Psalm 8 is in many ways a psalm about who you worship. For King David, it was clear. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. His faith was in God. So my appeal to you is to be like David and worship God and God alone. True worship of God will only come if you follow Jesus Christ. You must repent and you must believe in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Don't delay. Today is the day for you to sing, O oh Lord, my Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It's humbling. There's so much there. 
Why do you think of us? Why do you care about us? Because we are your creation. Help us to remember that. For those who are struggling with, should I follow Christ? I pray today would be that day that they would come. I pray that they would follow you, that they would love you more than anything else in this world. And that they would bend their name, or bend their knee to King Jesus. We say all this in your son's precious name. Amen.